and focusing specifically in the history of Archaeology astronomy in the United Kingdom, because that's kind of where the key developments of the discipline happened. So if you live and work in other countries, forgive me for not including them here, but I did say it was meant to be a brief history. So starting with a period I call the Antiquarian Age, and before I put Norman Lockyer's face on the screen, Archaeostronomy is really as old as archaeology. It goes back to the Antiquarian period, where we, you have these antiquarians in different countries all over the world, exploring these countries' landscapes, finding ancient sites, and then theorizing about these ancient sites, collecting these ruins, trying to make sense of them with the limited understanding and the limited methodology that they had at the time. And these people, at least in Britain, were already trying to relate ancient sites to the celestial objects. And there's a very simple reason for that. That's because you find that in the classical writings, going all the way back to ancient Rome. So they were basically classically trained and they were projecting these ideas onto the landscape. And there were many of them, too many for me to mention, but this all climaxed with Sir Norman Lockyer's public, three, three publications. Now, Norman Lockyer was a very important scientist at the time. He was really not an antiquarian, he was more of a scientist. He discovered helium. He was one of the founders of the journal Nature, which you all know. And in 1894, he published The Dawn of Astronomy, a study of the temple worship and mythology of the ancient Egyptians where basically he delineated a methodology that is roughly the methodology we still use today. Instead of speculating and using largely um, unsubstantiated claims, he was suggesting a very careful field survey of ancient sites using scientific tools and techniques to try to, to measure the orientation of the ancient Egyptian temples and then correlate those, or, those orientations with the location of the celestial objects. And then, because we know something about ancient Egyptian religion, ancient Egyptian cosmology, we know a lot more now than we did 100 years ago in his time, but there were some speculations back then, he tried to correlate the two. His findings in the field um, with, with the sky and also with Egyptian religion. He then came back to the UK and did the same with Stonehenge and the British Stone Monument. And finally, his last publication on the topic in 1909, Surveying for Archaeologists, where he actually delineates the methodology for the survey of ancient sites, which is really roughly the thing that we still do today. And that says a lot about where we are today, actually, but we'll come back to that. Now, the next few years, um, archaeology astronomy kind of disappeared from the public record in the UK. Uh, of course, the two world wars were in the middle, so that, that might not be surprising. But then, a second phase starts, which I'm calling the loss of innocence, which is really when archaeology astronomy came to the attention of the general public, not just the academic. And that happened in the 60s, with the publication of this book, Stonehenge Decoded by Gerald Hawkins, an American, not British, and also not an archaeologist. So at this point in time, archaeology had already established itself as a discipline. It already had chairs of archaeology in many um, institutions, and even a department, well, two departments of archaeology in the UK. So archaeology had established itself. Archaeostronomy had kind of disappeared. Until this guy, uses for the first time a computer, this is in the, in the time when computers were the size of a room, and he uses it for the first time in the humanities, it's the first use of digital humanities ever. And what does he do with it? He puts an archaeological plan of Stonehenge where the locations of all the stones of Stonehenge were marked into the computer, and he gets the computer to calculate all possible combinations of stones, get the orientation of those combinations, and then compare those orientations with the movements of the sun and the moon, and, the, and some stuff. And of course, he found lots of alignments. Because of course, when you have so many stones, 
you will find lots of alignment. So there's lots of things happening in the sky, so it's easy to find these things. He used those findings and he interpreted them in a way that was anathema to the archaeology of the time. He saw in Stonehenge evidence of megalithic scientists, prehistoric scientists, astronomer priests that built Stonehenge as a computer. Now Stonehenge is roughly 5,000 years old. And of course the archaeologists at the time, a lot more than they are today, were primitivists. They thought of prehistoric people as primitive. So the idea of Stonehenge Builder as a having a scientific mind and having a primitive mind was just inconceivable. And this led to a huge debate that actually got into the public eye in the UK. It was really very lively. To the point that archaeologists invited the key astronomer of the time, Fred Hoyle, who was the astronomer royal, to review Hawkins' work. And what Hoyle did was, was, was quite funny, because he did review the work, but instead of trashing it, which is what archaeologists expected him to do, he found an even easier way to use Stonehenge as a computer that could be used to predict eclipses. So this just, just backfired, really. It backfired. But the debate went on, and eventually um, it reached a conclusion. But that conclusion was really not reached until another character comes into play. Alexander Thorne, who was an engineer by trade, and he was a very good surveyor. And while that debate was going on, behind the scenes, this guy was very silently, but very meticulously, walking around the countryside in the UK and surveying the megalithic sites, measuring them to a degree of precision that had not been achieved by archaeologists at the time. And then doing what Lockyer had done in the past, looking at the celestial objects, seeing if there were correlations. And he also made some bold claims, some of which were more amenable, others less so. But the point is that he did what Hawkins was not doing. He went out, he went out into the field. He was measuring things as they are on the ground, whereas Hawkins was using a unreliable, with unknown accuracy, plan of where the stones of Stonehenge are, rather than actually measuring them. This was appealing to archaeologists, because archaeologists are used to going out into the field and measuring things on their own. So they actually started to engage with Tom. They started to invite him for conferences. Discussions started to happen. Until eventually, and person, an insider from archaeostronomy, kind of disrupted this. Not just one, there were many people. I'm, I'm simplifying. But this is really where we get to the present age. And it's the figure of Clive Ruggles, really, who was perhaps the most vocal and the most consistent person in undermining the interpretations of Alexander Tom by showing how his, his evidence was based on biased data. Because instead of, for instance, looking at all the sites of the same type and checking whether or not they had an orientation that was statistically significant and therefore potentially intentionally laid out, he was selecting his sites. He was selecting the ones that fit to the theory. Maybe not consciously, I'm not saying that was the case, but the, the fact is, when you actually look at the entirety of the archaeological record, that significance is not there. And therefore, the significance of his findings and his interpretations is undermined. So this started the present age of archaeoastronomy. Clive's obsession with mainly two things. Fieldwork, which is something that Tom was keen on, and we still believe it's very important, but the second one was statistical significance. Actually thinking whether or not those alignments that we are seeing could be due to chance, or not. And if not, why not? And then that's when things become interesting. Another key figure of the period, it's a bit contested, because uh, they have 
very different views of the world, very different backgrounds as well, is Michael Hoskin, who surveyed thousands of megalithic monuments across the Western Mediterranean, including here in Portugal. And he was actually instrumental in training an entire new generation of people in archaeoastronomy. And of course, this is basically where SEAC, the society we're here representing, comes into play. Five minutes already, Jesus Christ, okay. <laughs> right, so that's it. <laughs> but, and I was just getting to the meat. <laughs> now, I'm going to be controversial, and I'm being filmed. Um, and I'm going to say, well, yes, this is the present age where we are, it's very nice, but it's also a kind of a dark age, in need of a renaissance. I'm going to try to explain why in five minutes. Um, <laughs> On the one hand, we have really high-quality academic works, which are really epitomized by this three-volume opus, edited by Clive Rutherford, Handbook of Archaeostronomy and Ethnostronomy, which was published by Springer. I'm not trying to publicize this. But there is some really high-quality work in archaeostronomy being done right now in the world. There's no questions there. But for instance, much like this volume, those works are highly academic, also in their language, in the place they are published, in the price they cost, because this cost about a thousand euros. <laughs> so it's not really widely available. On the other hand, we, we have the media misrepresenting those academic works, and I know because that's about my study here in Portugal. <laughs> I've never said those things. <laughs> Both sentences just so, the media are just shaping and misrepresenting our findings, transforming them into big headlines that sell. And then we have pseudo-academic works that are also getting media attention because they are big headlines. And when I say pseudo-academic works, I'm talking here about academics that are not trained in cultural astronomy or the humanities, they stumble upon something that they think is meaningful and they think that it's the answer to everything. They, and because they are academics, they have an academic affiliation, the media gives them credit, even though their work is not validated by people who actually know what they're doing. And then, of course, we have the other pseudo-archaeologists, the, the ancient aliens crowd and, and ancient Atlantis and whatever you want to call it, which are incredibly popular, much more popular than any academic. I mean, look at this, I, I took this from the internet. Ancient Aliens has been on TV for 10 years, and it continues to be as popular as ever. And the key problem, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with all of this variety, diversity of things existing, the key problem is that we're doing nothing about these three things. The field as a whole is not engaging and critiquing these things. It's not teaching the media. It's not teaching the general public. It's not trying to publish things that are widely available that can help in that education of the general public. Now, why is this happening? One thing is undeniable. This is appealing. You see a photo of Stonehenge, summer solstice, sunrise, in alignment with Stonehenge. You see a photo of winter solstice, sunrise at Newgrange. It connects to you. Thousands of people go there to see this every year. People want to see this. They're interested. Why is that? I think it's because we've lost connection to the sky in our daily lives. Light pollution, skyscrapers, busy lives. We lost that connection. So whenever we see something like this, we go for it. So if I show you a picture of, of sun rising in alignment to any megalithic site anywhere, and I tell you there's meaning there, you're going to connect with it. You, it's going to sell newspapers. Even though the science, the academic work, might all be rubbish. So we need to balance those things out. How much time do I still have? I have one minute. Right. So I have a huge list of current problems that I think we should uh, address. <laughs> Um, which is on the screen, and um, you can read. I'm just going to go through the headlines. Insufficient cultural context. Lots of archaeoastronomers are trained in astronomy only, not in humanities, and they fail to engage with the wider record, the archaeological record, the historical record. 
There's an ethnocentric bias still. We've moved away from the megalithic observatories, megalithic science astronomer priests of Alexander Tom. But yet, there's still an emphasis on precision alignment. Maybe not high precision, but precise enough. As an emphasis on the sun, even though we know from the historical record and the ethnographic records that the, the moon, the stars, the Milky Way were also important. Pseudo-data analysis, we don't really have a statistical method yet. We look at histograms and try to make sense out of histograms, even though there's really good stats out there that can be used. We don't yet have an accepted theory or, or even widely used methodologies. Everyone agrees we must go out into the field, but everyone does different things when they're out in the field. So, and of course then there's the isolationism. No public engagement, no academic engagement, and no critique of self or others. So, we're still far from the high bar of calling ourselves a discipline, if, we, if you trust me on this. And this is the work that we need to do. And that's why we're here, engaging with people with completely different uh, skill sets. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm just going to have to skip through that light, because I now have a negative minute. Um, basically in the UK, we, we're having this approach which, which we've called skyscape archaeology. We're trying to move away from archaeoastronomy, from the, the associations that archaeoastronomy has in the UK, uh, by integrating this study within archaeology itself. And this can only start from a deep level of theoretical and methodological reflexivity of self-criticism of the methods and the ideas we bring to this study. That's the key foundation of skyscape archaeology. And the other one, of course, is engaging with the social-cultural context of these studies. You can't just go to a site, measure an alignment, and then say, oh, it's aligned to the sun on winter solstice. No, you need to understand what that might have meant to the people who built that monument. Uh, we've been quite successful, I was going to say, in the UK, archaeologists are really picking up on this, um, but there's still a lot of work to do, and I think I will end on this slide. I think what we really need to do is engage with other fields and disciplines. Again, that's what we're doing here today, trying to see ourselves from your eyes, um, but also spend some time re-evaluating the, the methodologies we have, establishing new ones, because while we were busy building a fortress around ourselves, trying to make sure that we had high quality work, the rest of academia, all these other disciplines, have been evolving, and we need to catch up. Move behind the, beyond this alignment hunting idea into more interesting research questions, because Archaeologists, linguists, historians are not interested in whether or not this site was aligned to the Sun or the Moon or the Milky Way. They're interested in things like cosmology, ontology, of meaning. And we need to really move into that in a more systematic way. And of course engage with the public. So now that the, the doom and gloom of uh, archaeoastronomy is done with, I think I, I will end here and move on into the more positive talks of the other speakers of this session. So thank you.